and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Episode 74, Missing in Action, What to Do When You're Missing a Player or Players. From Hamilton, I'm Sean, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Uh, today's main topic is one of absentee players and what to do when one or more players can't make it to game night. In addition, I've got a review of Eminent Domain Escalation. Uh, this week's Bellhop's Tabletop is going to be a short one, but I do have a bit to say about a prototype game, Gorinto. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found everywhere as Dark Elf LX. And my voice is already starting to die, so we'll see how well this goes. All right, well, up first, a comment from Chris Groff on one of our older tile-laying posts. Chris writes, This just makes me sad that Infinite City is no longer in print. Also, another game that kind of fits this list, if you squint, is Neuroshima Hex. I know it's not technically tile placement in this sense, but if you're placing tiles onto a grid to represent your units, very strategic, fast pace, and really a lot of fun. There's also a fantasy version called Monolith Arena. I haven't played it yet, but by all accounts, it's just as good and with a couple of new twists. Oh, thanks, Chris. Uh, I gotta admit, I'd never heard of Infinite City. I'd have to look that one up. Hiroshima, I know well, though. I have, I don't know, one of the printings. It's in, like, third or fourth edition now. Very cool game. Uh, I don't know what came first, that or the app. I first played it on an app. And, yeah, it's a tile game. I guess it counts. We were more looking for games like Dominoes and stuff like uh, Carcassonne or whatever. But I guess they're tiles. To me, it's almost a miniature game using tiles. Very cool game. Uh, it works. Monolith Arena, I had not heard of. I didn't even know there was a fantasy version of it. If it plays the same, I assume it's still a good game. Like I said, Hiroshima definitely is a thumbs up for me. It's a cool game. Well, Clay Siolan wrote about must-have gaming accessories. Concerning things you may not need, but you, you want to have to make your gaming experience more appealing. A few years ago, I decided to buy an unusual deck of cards for poker. And now my collection consists of more than 50 different right. decks. If you enjoy playing something, why not diversify it? All right, thanks, Clay. Uh, sounds like Clay's a big traditional card game player. Nothing wrong with that. My parents have been card game players for years. I've played enough tricking take, trick taking games in my life. Uh, there are plenty of great games to play with a deck of cards, though. For tabletop gaming and hobby gaming specifically, the place I see people going nuts for unique playing card decks is actually on the role playing side of things, and that is for Savage Worlds. Because in the Savage World role-playing game, you need two things. You need a deck of cards and you need bennies. And I've seen card decks used as bennies, for one. But the other thing is that card deck is used for initiative. And every round, you're going to shuffle the deck of cards and hand out a deck of cards. And if you're running a superhero game, having a bunch of superheroes, running a Western game, having an old-school Western game, it's a thing. Savage World's DMs, I don't know what they call DMs, whatever Savage World's moderators call themselves, are really big on having custom decks of cards and usually custom poker chips for the... Um, the bennies as well. Huge market in that. Interesting. My kids just got a Hogwarts deck for Christmas, which is interesting in that it has all the four houses, but they're the, the four Hogwarts houses rather than standard suite. So oh, okay. there is no heart. It's, you know, the Gryffindor is the heart you know, or, <laughs> or whatever. Um, so you got to decide in advance. When you're, how yeah, you, depending how, on the game you're playing, it may matter, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Well, now Jason has a game to add to our list of best games when you have exactly five players. All right. That game is Cosmic Encounter. Well, I'm glad you dig Cosmic Encounter, Jason. And I know a ton of people love this game. There is a lot of love out there for a game that came out in the 70s and is still in print to this day. Uh, even Tom Vassell, that's he stated many times in many places that it is his favorite game of all time. 
personally, I don't get it. I did not enjoy this game. I only played it twice. I gave it two shots. It was bad enough that I gave up after two. I just found it way too over the top and way too random for me. Um, as for our viewers, though, uh, the game's popular enough. It could be a great choice for other people's five-player game night. And we'll make sure to throw it in the show notes, but I don't need it at mine. All right, well, continuing with further five-player game recommendations, Pod Coke writes El Grande, Medici, and New Amsterdam, and New Amsterdam come to mind. Nice additions to the list, Todd. I have no complaints there. I got to admit, I'm surprised I didn't put El Grande on the list myself. That's one of my favorite. I still think it is the best, most pure area majority game ever made. I love that game. So, yeah, that was an oversight on mine. That should have been on my list. All right, well, John uh, Sim Simantov says, great list. At five player, I also really like Quacks of Quedlinburg with the Herb Witches expansion, mm. which adds a fifth player, and since the game is mostly simultaneous, adds very little playtime. Oh, cool. Uh, well, thanks for the comment, John. Uh, I really need to try Quacks of Quedlinburg. Like, not only have I heard good things, we even once did a raid on our Twitch channel, watched some people playing. Like, it looks like a great game. And I there's a there's a local gamer Sebastian that has brought it out to local events, and I have friends that really dig it, including Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, who who's raved about the game. I just I haven't had a chance to play it myself, so maybe when I get a chance to play it, I'll throw it on my list. All right, well, continuing on with more five player game recommendations, uh, Gugin, China, uh, China, China writes it's two h's i'm not yeah sure how right Sorry. how is santiago not on this list as a five-player game now gug and i actually know he's uh it's great to hear from him actually i hadn't heard from him in quite a while he used to come out to some of our events here in windsor he was at the university of windsor at the time i haven't seen him in long enough that like for all i know he moved back home or he's moved to toronto or something i'm not sure so gug if you're still in windsor we got to hook up so you can show me why santiago should be on my five-player game list because it's not on the list because i've never played it so I, it's one I know of. Like it's it's a well known classic game, and just not one I ever got to the table. So if you're still in Windsor, hook hook up with me. Show me how to play Santiago. I'd love to hang out again. All right, and for our final comment about games best at five, we've got quite the list from Neil Helmer. Neil was even cool enough to break them into categories. So All our right. five player games of note not featured: Udum Heavy, Pax Pamir Medium Heavy, Caverna Medium Heavy. Struggle of Empires, medium. Kalis, medium. Princes of the Renaissance, medium heavy. Blood Rage, light medium. Tapestry, medium. Orleans, Orleans, medium. Orleans. And Hy Hyperborea, medium. All right, that is quite the list. Thanks for all the great suggestions, Neil. Uh, Neil's another local gamer who gets in way more gaming than I do, like way, way more. Uh, I gotta say there's something to be said for a steady group that meets at least once a week and games for three, four, five hours into the night. So Neil's got a nice steady group that literally meets every Saturday. He's got me beat on that one. And they play a lot of games. And they are a group that play the same games over and over and over until they basically burn out on the games. So um, to go through Neil's list pretty quickly here. So Pax Premier, haven't played this. Neil promised to teach me it at some point, and that hasn't happened yet, so I couldn't tell you. Caverna, I dig it. I can see it. But personally, I find it a little too long with five. I... Excuse me. I prefer the game with three or four players to the, for for my table. Tapestry. Everyone is talking about this game. Heard many good things about it, though I hear that Jamie has some rule changes that people really should check out, that he, he rebalanced the game after it got out. I guess there's some DLC, basically, for Tapestry, but I haven't had a chance to play even with the base rules yet. But man, that game looks good. Uh, Struggle of Empires. I have played this. I played it at Extra Life with Neil and Eugene. I only played it with three players, though, so I haven't tried it with five myself to know. Definitely a decent game, an older, really older Feld. Uh, Kalis, wow, talk about the new hotness from 2005 here, Neil. Uh, this one slipped my mind, uh, just like I forgot one on the last category there. I forgot El Grande. Kalis, I also forgot. Both of them being really old games from, you know, the early 2000s. I think uh, El Grande is probably even older. Yeah, that one's totally fair. Kalis, the game that made worker placement famous, so that that totally fits. I need to dust off my copy of Kalis. I haven't played it in forever. Um, and I know there's also Kalis Magna Carta, the card game, which I've heard is also good. Uh, and Kalis 1303, which is the 2019 version. Oh, see, I didn't know a new Kalis came out. I wonder if it's just a reprint and a re-theme or if it's actually uh, different. It, it's called a re-implement. I don't know what, what huh? that would, you know. 
All right, I might have to check that out. Kalis literally was such a big deal when it came out. Like, everyone remembers when Dominion came out and everyone started doing deck building. Well, Kalis was before that and was the first game to really use worker placement. And I remember at the time, someone making a ton of money on Board Game Geek by making a shirt that said, and then on the seventh day, God created Kalis, <laughs> which upset some people, but, like, this was a, a an early geeky shirt. Like, just Kalis was the next best thing. Or on the eighth day, I guess it would have been on the eighth day, God created Kalis. Uh, back to Neil's list, Princes of the Renaissance. This is another super old one. I've never played it. Um, you don't hear much hype about this one. Uh, this one, Neil, hey, let's hook up some weekend and you can teach me how to play it and I'll let you know if I think it's good with five. Uh, Blood Rage. This is one that along with Scythe are like, these are probably the two super hot games everyone loves that I just didn't enjoy. Um, I tried Blood Rage three times before just giving up on it. It just wasn't for me. I couldn't tell you exactly what I didn't like about it. I just never had a great time playing that game. Uh, Orléans, I could have put it on the list. The problem is it needs an expansion to play five players. And when I was making the list, I was trying to do with just base games that are good with five players. Like we could possibly do a whole other list of games that are good with five players once you buy the expansion. So that's the only reason that didn't make it on there. Orléans, I think I was the one that introduced you to it years ago, is a fantastic game. And then speaking of games I introduced you to, Hyperborea. I actually feel bad for missing this because I remember standing in Geektropolis when it was closing and going, Neil, buy that game. And you're like, eh, I don't know about that. I'm like, no, no, buy this game. You and the Chopes, your group of players are going to love this game. It's a bag builder. Yeah, I know it looks kind of like Descent or Hero Quest, but that's not at all what it's like. It's actually a fairly heavy Euro. You're going to love this game. And sure enough, Neil got it was obsessed with it, went to the ends of the earth to get the expansions for it, and they play it regularly. So yeah, that should have been on my five-player list. I, I dig the game or else I wouldn't have recommended to him. But yeah, that, Hyperborea is the, like, it, it's the Shafauza, but in the good way, where shafauza has got all the fantasy stuff on it, and then the game's kind of terrible. This is the game that has all the fantasy stuff on it, but the game's actually awesome. Right. Uh, and so just uh, a note, Kalos 1303 has been streamlined and modernized for an intense and shorter game, according to the publisher. That, that doesn't actually sound better to me, because yeah. I really like the original. It, it's kind of like the Terraforming Mars without the corporate wars, is what that sounds like to me, which just isn't quite as good a game. I'd love to try it. If, if anyone local's got a copy of Kalis, let me know. Yep. All right. Uh, and then finally, a comment on our games to buy when you've got $50 to spend from a couple of weeks ago. Greg Lauer right. writes... You can get just about any Powered by the Apocalypse RPG, Apocalypse World, Dungeon World, Masks, and games that sprung from that rule set, like Blades in the Dark, Scum and Villainy, for well under $50. Never mind other fun independents like Microscope and Fiasco. All right, very good point, Greg. Uh, totally legit. The thing was, when I was trying to make that $50 list, and I talked to Sean about this, I think I mentioned it in the episode, um, I was trying to do the prices Right thing. I was trying to get as close to 50 without going over, so instead of going, you can get these 20 games for 50 bucks, I was trying to go like, you do know you can get um, Coimbra for $49.99 right now? Or you can get, I think Castles of Burgundy Deluxe just got came out, and that's like $49.99, right? And it's a fantastic game. So I was aiming for that. So I is fair enough. For 50 bucks, actually, you could probably pick up two or three great independent RPGs. Like I, you can get a copy of Hydro Hacker Operatives for five bucks. Like, come on. Yep. That's, that's that's one of my favorite indie games from one of my favorite designers. So it is easy enough to get a bunch of great indie games and then also support independent content creators, which I am all about. Just in that post, I was trying to do the the the, the, the closest to 50 without going over. And uh, Phil Vecchione, you should probably be clipping that and putting it onto a website. He just did <laughs> say. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content not there anymore the high drackers was still literally sitting right there well we start wednesday nights at 9 p.m eastern here on twitch and we love people who come in and take part in our chat room the lobby we if do. you're live remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell tonight we've had a discussion about uh you know some of the things we've had in our suggestions uh people talking about games like you know cribbage you know we started talking about playing kicks yeah. there's so many so many fantastic games out there um, I did see Ryan's comment about the designer of Cosmic Encounter going out of his way saying he wasn't interested in making it balanced, which is, yes, I, that's it, right? Like, it's it's a game where you're you're fighting for territory where you literally, you don't roll a die, you use, like, a spinner thing to figure out who you're all attacking this turn. Like, you don't get to pick. You don't get to go, I'm going to go after Sean or I'm going to go after the point leader. It's like, oh, th this turn we're all going to beat up the Anna just because. 
And then you have ridiculous player powers, like someone who's allowed to cheat until they get caught. And if they get caught, they're out of the game. And like, that's literally one of the alien powers. It just, I, it was too, I don't know, gonzo, I guess for me. Right. Like I like heavy euros. Come on. Yep. And I admit, I like the light, light party games sometimes too, but like, it, it's not a light party game though. It's like a big sci-fi game and lots of components. And it looks like it's trying to be a heavy game, but it's just, it's too over the top. Just not for me. Uh, I'd rather and, play Blood Rage or Scythe than yeah. Cosmic Encounter. Uh, and Ryan's pointed out that uh, or, uh, Orléans completely overshadowed, over, overshadowed oh, yeah. Hyperborea. Yeah, uh, yeah. For Bag really Builder, for that, that mechanic, happened. but very different games. But if you wanted to highlight the bag building mechanic, yeah, I'd, I'd point to Orléans as well. I totally agree. But the difference, I don't know. Hyperborea just had some neat stuff, and I was actually working at one time. I'm turning it into an RPG, because in that game, that this is the fantasy element is as you level up your character, you have stats like strength, dex, con type of thing. They're not called that. I don't remember what they're called. And they're represented by different colored cubes. And when you level up, you can put more cubes of that type of stat in your game. And the red cubes are strength and they're for attacking. And you have two different options to attack. And like the green ones are for moving. I'm getting the exact colors and stuff wrong because it's been a while since I played it. And I really like the idea that on your turn, you draw cubes out of your bag and then you, that tells you what you can do. But then if you level up in strength, you're going to draw more red cubes because you're stronger and you have more. And that, that was a big part of the game. And I kept thinking there's there's got to be an RPG system in here where I'm like playing D&D &D and as I level up, I put cubes in and the, or whatever, cubes, dice, whatever they were going to be. And then like when I go to attack, I pull out a handful of cubes and those are my combat options. I, 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 was, I was working on it enough that like I never sat down and put it on paper, but I kept coming up with ideas in my head. Right. But then the problem is it's an RPG. And the whole, I go swing to attack the guy. What if I don't draw any red cubes? Like what <laughs> happened that turn? Like what, what's the run. narrative? You, yeah. You know, there's, there's that's definitely... your fumble. I don't know. Like I, yeah, I, I, I didn't, obviously didn't develop it. It's it's one of those, it would, it would be a, a randomized um, combat. Like I could see it as a really interesting randomized combat narrative. So you aren't deciding what action you're deciding so you do how to express round. You're the gonna, action that comes from the bag. Basically. Yeah, yeah. You want you want to do it as input randomness instead of output randomness. Yeah. So you want to do it so that you get your options by drawing from the bag. Right. Like here's your options this turn. It's, it's, yeah, it's a storytelling adventure. It, you know, you're something. you're trying to figure out how to express those cubes or those dice yes. or whatever yep, yep. in the best way possible. I could totally get into that. <laughs> yeah, as, as opposed to the opposite, where you're like, I attack the guy, then draw to see if I got the stuff to do it. Yeah. Which would be output randomness. Yeah, no, I would absolutely get into that. No, like I said, I, I still think there's some validity there. I thought Because that was one of the things I really liked. That was the one fantasy element I liked, is I liked the, I, you could level up your character, that you could get better at the things so you draw more cubes. Like, there was more to it. Like, the game's got a whole thing where you can develop technologies, but by doing that, you produce waste, which are black cubes that you right. can't do bad things, and there's ways to get rid of it. And then the whole thing's on this big hex map, and it's actually a dudes on the map board game for area control and you can loot tombs and once you got the expansion it e added even more fantasy elements where you had heroes right so one of your characters would be represented by a hero and but it still was really a dry euro bag builder when it had this box of like these characters walking in a post-apocalyptic board round and they look like characters out of gauntlet because they're all color-coded like the red one's a big burly warrior the green one's an elf <laughs> but yeah misleading game like like the cover yeah. totally you would not buy this game if you were looking for a euro and if you were looking for a game that like this, you'd get it home and be like, where are the minis? Like, So uh, thanks to uh, some of the recent uh, releases on, on Kickstarter yesterday, uh, which we don't have actually in, even in, as, as part of our topic, uh, Christian Kang just tweeted and, and, and did the mic drop. You're not a valid gamer if you don't back every single Kickstarter forever. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, yeah, there's there's so, there's gatekeeping I can get behind. If yeah. you don't back everything, you're you're... <laughs> You're not a real gamer. I'm sure that I'm sure the the amount of of Twitter garbage going on about those three games that dropped yesterday because I, I didn't one, even see what dropped yesterday. Oh, so. Dark Tower and then well, two yeah, others. Yeah, Dark Tower. Dark Tower dropped on the thirteenth. Was the thirteenth? Yeah, but yeah, okay. So we yeah, this, I this week. I remember going Dark Tower dropping on my birthday. Yeah, yeah. This, this week, uh, three games dropped on the same day, and in the first day, got over two million dollars wow. between the three of them. Yeah. Dark Tower doesn't surprise me at all, but um, but it was the, the, it was one of those things where two hundred and fifty five dollars to go all in U.S. Yeah, Oy. not surprising. Boy, <laughs> only if someone sends it to us. Yes, I, I yeah I I could try to contact. I I don't have a contact for Restoration Games, and I don't think they need to. 
Yeah, no, I'm sure they've. There's going to be like, so many enough people. There's big reviewers that want it that yeah, yeah. they don't need to send that to someone. I'm, I'm like sure this. you know. Tom Bassett I, I, I got a copy. Care, and... This way, I don't. I don't think this needs to be dinged out. But I don't have the balls for that one yet. We don't. We don't have the numbers to justify me asking them. Yeah. I'd rather go to them in a year or so when I have bigger numbers where I can be like, so I don't be that guy that bugs them every year. Yeah. yeah. Or you know, Ray, you, they'll they'll be at Origins, right? Drop by and uh, you know. Yeah, we'll see. Drop by and say hi. Just just introduce yourself and shake hands at Origins. And I did not see them last year. The problem is that they were small enough that I think they were with another booth because a lot of, a lot of the smaller companies will share a booth. So if Restoration Games was there, I think they might have been with Roxley Games. Mm. Possibly. I don't know. I don't I don't back as many Kickstarters as before. Not just for budget reasons. Like I don't know if you right. saw the ridiculous price drop on the Terraforming Mars expansion. Oh. It's flipping 54% off already. Ouch. Like 54%. It's 16 bucks. Ouch. Like it just came out. I couldn't believe that. That's... Now I will admit, I got some Kickstarter exclusives, but like the big thing is the, the double layered things. And I don't technically need those because I bought something on Etsy that's nice and color coded. Yep. Right? Like to me, those were a nice to have. So like, yeah, I got a couple extra corporations and some new project cards. Yep. Or I could have saved like $40 Canadian. So yeah, that one hurt. Yeah, yeah, I get that. All right, well, we'll be back checking into the lobby a few more times during the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere. It's Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to come through us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. And I got to say, this seems to be working because I have been getting questions asked in like the comment sections of other people's posts now. So I'm, I'm totally cool with that. I want to be known as the guy that people ask questions. So that came up the other day. Like someone was just like, hey, I am looking for a cheap miniature game with fantasy miniatures in it. And I'm like, okay, are you just looking for the miniatures or are you looking for a game? They're like, no, no, I just want a bunch of miniatures cheap. And I've been told buying board games is better than like going and buying Warhammer, right? So I'm like, oh, fair enough. Rune Wars <laughs> is like $26 on flipping Walmart right now. And it's a $100 game. So head right over there. So, and that was like in a thread about something completely other side. They're like, oh, so Mo. <laughs> Heck, Phil Vicion pulled that one yesterday or the last week in the, in the, um, the middle of doing their podcast recording, he's like, wait, Mo, what was that game? Yep. Which I thought was pretty good. And then yep. uh, Chris Nisak was pointing out that one of, was he like the computer for you? He's just like, <laughs> Mo, can you answer this question about board games? I'm all good for that. I, I, I like it. I want that to keep continuing. And I got to admit, I'm no longer having to beg for questions. We're, we've got a, we got a nice build up again, which is awesome. And if I don't get to your question, I do apologize. It, we may get to it eventually. Some questions fit better than others. There's lots of things that make us decide. If you really want your question answered, just plug me again. Say, hey, I asked this a while ago and you never got back to me, and I'll see if I can bump it up the list. All right. Uh, so far, 2020 has sucked for me. I have spent most of 2020 with my new close buddy, Streptococcus A, dealing with not one, but two bouts of strep throat. Uh, it started to the night before uh, New Year's Eve in 2019, and I don't know if you can hear it in my voice, but I am still fighting it to this day and still taking pills for it even right now. So it has been terrible. Um, strep throat's pretty horrible. Uh, the way I was describing it is I think my Adam's apple was replaced by a spiky ball of obsidian because every time I swallowed, it just felt like it was tearing me apart. It was really a not fun. Now, one of the unfortunate side effects of this, uh, other than shit, oh, terrible pain, has been that it's affected my regular gaming group. Uh, as well as some of the local gaming events here in Windsor. And I've had to cancel some pretty big events. Um, so I thought today an appropriate topic for the show would be to talk about what do you do when someone has to bail on game night? When one or more of the players can't make it, uh, whether it's for illness, doesn't have to be strep throat, but for whatever reason it is. Well, now, first, oh, yeah. go ahead. Nope, nope, sorry. Uh, first off, I want to say canceling anything sucks. Like, it really does. For especially the other people that you're gaming with, not necessarily for you. Just try not to do it, if at all possible. 
Um, I realize some people are of the opinion it's only gaming, but gaming can be a very important aspect of many people's lives. And I'm not just talking about people like, oh, their heads in the crowd escapism. No, it's important. It's a, it's a thing. Personally, I, I like to think of having a regular game night or a regular game group as being like being on a sports team or as important on that. If you fail to show up for the game, you're letting down not just yourself, but the entire team. Yep. It's only gaming. It's only a family dinner. It's just one vote. Little things can have big effects. Don't underestimate the power of social shared social experiences. Now, one aspect of this comes up when you've actually signed up to play a game. Like, like think about it beforehand. Like before the first game night, when you commit to going to a game night, to showing up, whether that's you're going to play one game on Saturday or whether it's I'm going to be there every two weeks or I'm, we're going to meet once a month, whatever the, the, the commitment is, make sure you can actually commit to it. Yeah, sure, I'll be there. When you're actually thinking, you know, this would be kind of neat to do if I can make it, that's not cool. If you can't commit, be honest about it. I'd love to play, but I don't know if I can make it or... I, I'll try to make it, but I might not be able to, is way better than saying, yeah, yeah, no problem, I'll be there, and then not showing up. Yeah. Only commit to a level you're comfortable with. If a group demands a weekly session and you're not sure that's possible, don't say you will, expecting, oh, they'll be fine if I take a week off now and then. No, they really won't. Yeah. Uh, and it's rude of you to expect them to. Uh, booking a game night is a commitment. Try to stick to it. Now, to the flip side of that, realize things happen. Unexpected obligations come up, especially with family and work. People get sick, cars break down. There are any number of very valid reasons for someone to cancel on game night. And that's not necessarily a reason to jump on the person. No matter how good your group is or how loyal and regular your players are, at some point, someone's going to have to cancel. Absolutely. A wheel falling off your car. Sickness. You can't plan for these. Your child's swimming lessons, a monthly third Friday of the month dinner with your in-laws. These are things that can be and should be planned for in advance. Yes, exactly. The other thing, too, is if you do find you have to break out on a gaming obligation, be sure to let everyone know. Let the entire group know as soon as possible. Even if you just got a heads up that you might need to cancel, let everyone know then. Like, oh, you know what? I just found out my mother-in-law is going to be in town. We're probably not going to have dinner till Saturday. But just in case, you know, I might not be able to make it Friday. I just wanted to let you guys know, let people know. Basically, over-communicate. The more heads up you give people, the better chance they can actually salvage that night and plan to do something else or play something else. And now this is more important, the larger the group is, and the further anyone in it might have to travel yeah. to take part. Very true. So the inevitable happens. Someone cancels. What next? One of the big things that's going to affect this particular topic, and my answer to this is whether or not your game group is uh, a standard board game night where you're just going to get together and play board games, or an RPG night. Or if it is a board game night, if whether it's some kind of legacy or campaign game. I guess the important thing is, do you need to have the same players present each week, each session, or not? As we've seen, some games like Gloomhaven in particular have built-in options for this sort of eventuality. You can do solo games, random dungeons, or even alternate parties. But if you're playing an RPG campaign and your wizard is sick on the night you're supposed to assault the orc keep, that might be an issue. All right, let's start off where the game group where it doesn't really matter if the same people are there each week and you're not playing any type of ongoing game. And I guess in most cases, this isn't a big deal. This, this is usually a pretty easy fix. The players who didn't cancel still show up and they play something. In many cases, this can still be the same game, especially with board games. Uh, there are very few games out there that are like, I can only play with player X. We only play with three players. If we don't have three players, we can't play. Most games have a range and yeah, sure. Some are better at certain player points, but most board games have a range. Yeah, and the host will most likely have other options. So if you were planning on playing this game that is best at five and you've been wanting to get it to the table with five players for months, just play a different game. Play, yeah. you know, because there's probably another game out there and odds are good that whoever's hosting or, or you know, uh, organizing the event 
doesn't only have games that only play five players. <laughs> that would be really hard to manage. I'm, I'm sure we could come up with something if we tried, but that's a lot of effort. So I am I am the four player game only. I only play four player games. I have a collection of 700 games that only play four yeah, players. Exactly. But yeah, it, it, even though there's games that different player counts, if that's a problem, pick something else to play. Right now, I admit this could suck. If you plan to play something specific, especially if the cancellation is last minute and you've done prep work, right? That's where that's where it, it, it it's terrible. Like if that's a board game and you went and you sat up the board and you put out all the player pieces and you shuffled the decks already and had everything ready to play, that kind of stinks. Uh, even if you had an RPG, right? And you planned out your adventure for the whole weekend and you spent 16 hours in the last week doing prep work and you're all ready to run the game and then you can't, really? Yeah, it sucks, and it's going to be frustrating, but really all you're losing is some time. Plus, especially in the RPG section, or if, say, you studied before a board game, reread the rulebook and watched some Watch It Play videos, any of that prep's still there. It's still in your head. Uh, any scenario building you did or rule revising or rule revision is still going to be there next week. So you just lost a bit of time. It's not that big a deal. Now, what I like to do when we can't play the game we were supposed to play is do something completely different. Break from the routine and give your social group, give your group, give your players, give your group of friends a break from what they usually do. Like if you usually play heavy strategy games, try something light. If you usually play light games, try something heavier. Pull out your food chain magnet. Go to the host's house and say, hey, what's the game that's been on the pile of shame the longest? And play that, whatever it is. Try a one-shot RPG, or if you're used to running a fantasy game, play a cyberpunk game the next session. Yep. Lasers and feelings, powers and punches, tights and fights. There are a huge <laughs> number of quick RPG one-shot options out there if your group's willing to just grab something, a one-sheet, and improvise. Yep. Now, the biggest problem, of course, is if you have that ongoing campaign, right? The game where you need the same players. And what you do is very much going to depend on your personal group and in particular, the game you're playing. Now, starting off with campaign style games, you probably have some few, a few options. Like Sean mentioned earlier, Gloomhaven or in Imperial Assault, there are options out there. And in both those games, you can actually just play a character short. You're just the, the game is designed to be played with up to four players. You can play with three. The scenarios adjust. The problem there, though, is the absent player may feel like they missed out on something. So be sure to talk to them and see if they're cool with you continuing the game without them. Now, this has come up multiple times with our personal Groomhaven group, which we stream on Friday nights on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tabletop And the answer for us was to do casual gameplay in Gloomhaven, which meant either redoing missions we'd already done just to see if we get some more gold or XP or to get a treasure we missed or playing through random dungeons. We had a lot of fun playing random dungeons. And then once coming back from Origins, we picked up the solo quest book for Gloomhaven, and that's what we've been doing lately, is letting everyone run through their solo quests. Now, this totally depends on the game. Some games are going to have this, some games are not. Now, I think moving forwards, personally, when possible, more games will likely have options, having seen the success of Gloomhaven mm -hmm. and, and others like this, uh, and being able to keep that game at the table, right? Because if, if a publisher can keep a game on the table, that means they're going to keep selling expansions and they're going to keep making mm -hmm. money off of it. So, I mean, in some ways, Gloomhaven has ha made a really smart move, making sure that if you were a player short or if you mm -hmm. were two players short, you could still keep playing that game. Yeah. Because... Like, technically, you can play solo. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, we'll talk about some things that happen later when yeah. things break down and cancellations happen more regularly. Yeah. Now, the other thing you see, like we were mentioning, Gloomhaven has alternate ways to play it. Besides just having like the the um, random dungeon games like Imperial Assault. Imperial Assault's a good example here because it has the campaign mode, but it also has a cooperative mode using an app. Or there's a miniature battle skirmish mode. And all of those are good ways to still play Imperial Assault without continuing your campaign. But at least your group still gets to get together and still play some Imperial Assault. And maybe you learn something that's going to be able, you'll be able to bring back to your main campaign. Now, if this isn't an option for your game of choice, you may need to look at playing something else or just canceling the game night overall. Now, 
my personal feelings, and I, I think most people probably agree with me on this, I lean very strongly on the play something else side of things, at least get together. While I know that everyone would rather be playing the main game, what, you, what, what you're supposed to be playing, I'd rather get everyone together and play something than totally cancel the week. And the reason for that is wanting to keep a feeling of continuity. You want to meet every week. You want people to get used to meeting every week or every month or whatever your time frame is. If you keep canceling week in and week out due to one player or another, eventually you're not going to have that weekly group or monthly group. People aren't going to set the time aside for it. And when that absent player finally makes it back and shows up, one of your regulars is going to be like, oh, I made plans because we haven't played in months. I didn't think we'd be playing this week. Trust me, I have seen this happen with my own groups many times. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's all too easy for other players when one is canceled to use that as an excuse for themselves to cancel. Oh, yeah. well, if Joe can't make it, I could really use the time to do something. I, trust me, I'm sure many of us have done it. Yeah, you want to try to keep the consistency, right? Like, the we are going to do something. And I think I mentioned this later, but it was more about RPGs. But even if that something isn't necessarily playing a game, at least get together just to keep that time slot booked. Now, jumping over to the RPG side of things, and you actually have a lot more options because one of the great things about RPGs is their versatility. And an RPG, the GM, DM, Hollyhock God, whatever you want to call them, can literally make anything happen. The trick is keeping all the players interested and happy, including the ones that happen to be absent. So I know we talked about taking down the Star Destroyer tonight, but the Republic has informed you that the Imperial timetable has been altered and the ship will not be at the rendezvous point when expected. Instead, we've got this smuggler problem over here. Yeah, easy to do. Like, honestly, it really is. Now, some possible options are to continue the campaign without the absent player or players. This is something. Um, this is the same problem with the board game and continuing your Gloomhaven campaign without a player is the missing person may feel they missed out on something. But it can be the best option with an ongoing game with a very structured plot or something that's time limited. Like, for example, Shadows of the Demon Lord is designed to only play X number of sessions. So anything with those kind of time limits, you don't get those in a lot of games, but some games have them. Or if you're like, we are playing this game seven sessions and that it, and we're moving on to something else for whatever obligation, whether it's you promised another DM or whatever it is, you don't want to lose one of those weeks. Sure, it'll be tougher to fight the Goblin Army without your healer. But think how much more XP everyone will get with one less player. I don't think there's any RPG that's come out since the year 2000 <laughs> where you still divide XP by player, but maybe. <laughs> there's enough old school gamers out there still yep. playing with it. Uh, the trick here, of course, though, is what do you do with the character, right? The, the, the player is missing. Everyone knows that. What do you do with that character? And this is something you will probably find at least one podcast episode from every RPG podcast that's ever been written. You're going to find a million blog posts on. This is a big topic of discussion. With all the new people getting into D&D &D due to Critical Role and the 5th edition rules, I keep seeing these topics come back up, and it has for as long as I've been gaming. Um, the easiest, the the, the basic... One is the character's there, but they fade into the background. It's assumed they're doing their thing, but they just didn't have a huge impact on the plot. And well, nothing in the plot had a huge impact on them. Yeah, they're they're out in the back with the wagon train. Didn't you see them? They're they're covering the rear of the convoy. Don't that's, that's it. But remember, I said there were eighteen goblins there. Well, there was actually twenty three, and Sean's character took down those last five. Right? It's easy enough to do. Now, some groups like to have another player take over the character and play two. I personally have never been a fan of controlling more than one character in a role-playing game. I'm not a big fan of that. But you know what? In a board game with a campaign, like, I, sure, Imperial Assault, I'll control someone else's character. Yeah, no, absolutely. Many co-op games especially have rules for playing multiple characters at lower player counts. So no reason not to go with that to cover a missing player if possible. Now, my personal favorite way to handle this, because I like verisimilitude in my games. I like to, I like things that are happening in the metagame to make sense in the narrative. Something I've always been a big fan of is to find an in-game reason for that character to not be present. Uh, this works particularly well if the player absence is known well in advance and can even be part of the plot of the game. So the example I'm going to pull up here is I, I love 4th edition D&D. &D. We probably lost some subscribers for that, <laughs> but I really liked it. I ran a ton of 4th edition D&D, &D, both organized play and a home game. In my home game, 
Uh, I live in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, an automotive city. There is someone in our chat room right here who is not here every two weeks because he works shift work. That is what was happening in my game group. I had Mike Barker and another guy, Dan, in my group, and they worked opposite shifts. So in we were playing Keep on the Shadowfell, which is the first adventure in 4th Ed D&D if you're doing the whole Orcus plot, the whole you go from level 1 all the way to level 30 if you follow these books. And the group failed. The, the, the end of the plot in the first adventure is a portal to the Shadowfell was opened up and all of a sudden the Shadowfell spilling into reality. I took that right away and went, wow, this is simple. So every two weeks, a rift in the Shadowfell opens up and Mike Barker is suddenly in the Shadowfell. And well, out comes Dan's character out from the Shadowfell every two weeks. And that way, we always had the same number of players. Everyone was always there. And it became an in-game thing. Like it was uh, an actual thing the players were trying to solve which I, I don't think some of the characters got the metal plot of you're never going to solve this as long as they're working shift work. <laughs> but like it all made sense in game. Like I, I had players that I knew well ahead of time. They're going to be here or they're not. And well, that's when they're trapped in the shadow fell. And I'll admit I did some cool stuff so that the players didn't miss out on stuff where like if they came back, they could tell me a story of what they did in the shadow fell. And if they told a compelling enough story, they would get the XP the rest of the group got. So we had this whole thing where the, those Dan and Mike were coming up with this whole story of what was going on the other side of the world, which I thought was really cool. But that's a way to work it into the game. Yeah. And also, you can integrate some things like leveling mechanics. If you've, uh, if, there, if there's a mechanic built into your game where, you know, leveling up requires some effort, well, they went back to work with their master, study with their master yep. in their hometown and couldn't be here for that reason. But when they're back, they'll be le a level nine paladin instead, you know, or whatever. Yeah, I personally think that the whole you weren't here, you don't get XP is very old school grognardy way to think and you shouldn't punish people for not being able to show up. Unless the person has come up with BS excuses for not showing up, but then you should just have the adult conversation and tell them to leave the group. I, I, I don't believe in penalizing people for not showing up for valid reasons. And I actually don't believe in penalizing people for not showing up for not valid reasons. I just believe in don't game with that person anymore. All right. What about when you don't want to continue the main game, right? You don't want to continue the plot because something important is about to happen. You need all the players there, whatever it happens to be. Um, you really want to keep the group together. Uh, I basically mentioned this above. You still want to meet up and you actually want to game, right? Keep the schedule. You don't want to keep canceling the entire game night. So what do you do? One option that I like is to play the same characters and play through something that doesn't impact the main story whether it's a side quest or even cooler more modern gaming storyteller game play a flashback play something when, when all your characters were kids and they first met or do a total aside a similar rather fun option to play this is something i first saw recommended by robin laws was play in the same campaign world but play a different group of characters and one of the neater ones is make them players play their enemies play the bad guys play on the other side now, this is a great way to flesh out and experience more of your game world, to, to share that world from a different character's point of view, still getting the group to play in that same world, still having the experience, while not playing something else. I mean, you could even do something as interesting as playing bad guys and in from a third-party view, scoping out where your good guys are yeah. actually going to end up fighting in a week or so but you're actually seeing the bad guy's view of their own, you know, their own lair or their own exactly. cave or something like that. Uh, and, you know, you don't need to talk about it, but all of a sudden, two weeks later, the players walk in and go, hey, wait a second, <laughs> I recognize this. That is what we call dramatic irony. <laughs> yeah, I've actually had it where I had players plan, plant the traps for their own characters once, where they the, the one group, the group of players planned the defense of a castle, and then the same group of characters raided that castle and hated themselves for it <laughs> when they got to that point. Uh, now, there's another way to be able to stick to your regular game, but not play. Like, you're going to play. So this is to do something for your regular game that isn't play the game. Like, I, I'm fumbling on my English here. Now, like, like here, here's an example. So this is the week you guys all get together and you work on your heraldry or you all do character drawings, or you decide to map out your home base, or everyone decides, like fourth ed D&D, one of the things that some people really hated about the game is you could make a wish list for magic items. And I actually really like that system. 
I know verisimilitude is terrible, but you know what? I like metagaming. It was a great tactical game and players having the right equipment was very important. So this would be the week. You know what? Tom can't make it. We're all going to sit down. Everyone's going to revise the magic item wish list to make sure they're up to date. Or you're going to sit there and you're playing 3.5, a, a, a F20 game. You're going to plan out your next six character levels and all the feats you're going to take. I know this is something Sean used to love. He used to love planning out his stuff ahead of time. It's the metagame stuff, right? The stuff that's like cool to do that you sometimes do as lonely fun, but it's the kind of stuff you normally wouldn't do and interrupt the game for, but it'd be cool to have. Yeah. Personally, I will never turn down a chance to do long-term character arc or planning. Yeah. Uh, on our, you know, back when we first started playing and we were doing weekend Saturdays, Saturdays at the university, uh, we'd show up at whatever time, but the rest of the group wouldn't necessarily all have a fixed time for showing up. And if I had a couple of hours to kill, yeah, I would work on heraldry or mm. plan out character advancement or uh, I've had characters who had who ran a casino and we worked out the, you know, the math for what that kind of income was going to be over the month and, and you know, what the layout of the casino was. And that's all. There's a lot of stuff that you can do that isn't advancing the campaign, but is still advancing characters and advancing the world in general. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. I mean, I used to play Traveler on the computer for the character creation. Couldn't <laughs> stand the game. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that goes way back. Same thing with the actual. No, actually I actually like the RPG. I, I, we used to make DN and I used to make characters, traveler characters at the Bridge Tavern. Um, the other obvious answer, of course, is play another game, right? Um, I mentioned this when talking about board games. What I like to do is take a break. So I, I want whatever we play instead to be as far away as possible from what we're currently playing. Uh, with RPGs, obviously, the options are play board games, right? Um, play a one shot. Make characters for another system. I always try to make this very divergent, right? Like if I'm playing fantasy for my main game, let's play some cyberpunk one shots, right? Now there is a risk to this. One that my home group, uh, especially my older home, the, the group that, that I played with for years knows way too well. And that is the squirrel effect of getting distracted by whatever that new game is you played. Um, I don't know how many of my early campaigns ended because someone couldn't make it one week. So then we played something else and then everyone had so much fun playing that something else. We never went back to the original game. Now, unfortunately, Deanna is not in our chat room today due to uh, unforeseen circumstances. But if she was in there, she would be screaming in capital letters. Yes, yes, yes. I hate that. Basically, uh, there were so many games over the years. We're playing a Dragonlance campaign. Oh, Al can't make it. OK, let's let's play some cyberpunk. You know, what? let's play cops in cyberpunk. That'll be unique. And then I ran Cyberpunk for eight months. And then at some point, someone's like, oh, uh, we can't make it. And let's play something horror. I'm like, oh, I, I got this chill game from Mayfair. Yeah, and then we played that for six months. And we never went back to that original game. Yeah, well, sadly, there's no real way around this other than just trying to keep everyone on the same page and, and managing expectations. Yeah. Now, I'll admit, we were all really bad at the whole sitting down and actually discussing what we all wanted to do in a group. I don't know. I don't know why. Like, that. I'm sure this goes back to the 70s and guy gags where you just never really thought to say, hey, what do we all want to do? It was just always like the DM's going to going to lead the charge and everyone's going to follow or they're not because they don't want to play anymore. There was never that. I don't know. We never had the like, yeah, now and then be like, what do you want to play next? But it was just never the 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 session zeros that we talk about nowadays. And I think that's a big part of it. Like now you want to set that explanation. Like, yeah, yeah, we're going to play Cyberpunk, but it's only this week and we're going to jump back. And if they get to that point where someone doesn't want to jump back to another system, then you should be talking about, whoa, wait, why don't we want to jump back? What happened to that campaign? Do we want to end that campaign and have that conversation? Um, now, the important thing overall, this is this is going back to overall tabletop gaming, LARPing, whatever type of gaming you do. Um, have a plan in place, have that conversation. Basically, uh, I, I segue better than I thought to my own show notes, uh, perfectly, be preferably before absenteeism becomes a problem, but even better before the game starts, the campaign starts, the, the RPG campaign, the, the, we're going to get together every Saturday before that even really starts, before you have that first session, you need to sit down and have an open, honest conversation about what you're going to do. What What is the social contract? What do you do when someone doesn't show up? What do you do when two people don't show up? What causes you to say, you know what? Game night's off. We can't play at all. And what's the backup plan when you can't play your main game or when you do have to cancel the night? Yeah, uh, well, we've got one pa uh, patrons group plan that they have in place that covers almost all eventualities. And we'll talk about that when we get to the lobby after the main section.
Cool. I look forward to that. Uh, now, like I said, this is part of the social contract with your group. And no, by calling it a contract, I don't necessarily mean it needs to be a legal document or like something written down. But you know what? Some groups do write this stuff down. Uh, there was an RPG podcast out there. Uh, Sean and I were both diving, looking for this particular one that had a great one you could download. I couldn't find that. I did find some alternatives. Uh, if we do find the one I was looking for or a good one, we'll throw them in the show notes. We found some pretty good ones. But there are there's a reason to put it down. Yeah, no, absolutely. There uh, are a few of them out there, and many people have broached this topic. Uh, just Google uh, RPG so social contract or gaming social yep. contract, and and the uh, the list goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. Now I'm sure there's some of you out there that are shaking your head at the thought of writing this stuff down. But you know what? One of the things this does is indicate to everyone, to everyone in the group, how serious this is. As I said at the start of this, at the very top, you're signing up to play a game. That is you signing up for an obligation. You are now committed. It's just as important as an obligation, say your kids' hockey practice or your dinner plans with your mom. It's just as important. You are obligated to do this. And by putting it down on paper and putting down these social rules and these gaming table rules, these unwritten rules, make them written, just drives home how important the group is going to take that thing. Absolutely. And for some of us, probably more important than dinner with the relatives, but I digress. <laughs> Possibly. That's it too. Like the gaming should be as important. So when your mom calls up and says, no, I want to do this. Like, no, sorry, that's game night. It just is, right? And, and it's part of uh, gaming has become much more socially acceptable than it was back in the day. But it used to drive me nuts at, at my work, right? Uh, previous employees. I would be like, look, I need Friday night off because I am hosting a game night at the CG Realm. I can't work overtime that night. And they'd be like, no, no, we need you here. And then someone else would follow me in and go, no, no, I got hockey that night. I can't do it. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, you got hockey. And that was perfectly fine. I'm like, come on. It's the same thing. I'm letting down a team. Maybe I'm not flicking a puck, but that used to frustrate me a lot. I don't know how that changed now that I work from home and I don't work in the auto industry anymore. Maybe that's not as common as it was, but I, my guess is it probably is. Gaming is just as important as any other social obligation you have. Now, there is one final part of this topic I want to cover, something that's come up far too often for me personally in the last few weeks due to this damn strep throat, and that is what to do if the person has to cancel is the host or the organizer, the, 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 the person running things. This is really... The, the worst possible scenario, and one that you got to try to avoid as much as possible. In this case, most of what I said at the top is just as, if not more important. Make sure you're honest, only cancel for good reason, and be sure to communicate. And communicate as soon as you know there's a risk to the game night. Now, ideally, as we'll, we'll touch on later on, have a backup person. This is actually only a worst case scenario if your entire game strategy yeah. relies on one person to host and facilitate. If you have redundancies in place, this might just be another gaming night. Very true. Very true. Now, if at all possible, you want to have the game night go on. I've mentioned this multiple times. You don't want to cancel the, the entire thing. You don't want to call it off. You want to have people get together to get that regularity and knowing that, hey, every Monday we're gaming every Monday. Um, I know a few times, though, not often, I've had people in my house, gaming in my house while I was sick upstairs in bed, or I was working an unplanned overtime shift because, you know, they gave the guy who had hockey games the night off and I had to cover them. Um, if that, So people are at my house gaming because that's where we game. That's where the games are. I've got the big game room. I got the big game table. So they're gaming without me. If that's not possible, the rest of the group should still try to get together. Maybe you play at another player's house or you go to a coffee shop or a gaming cafe or a local game store. Even if you can't find a venue, I personally still think it's worth getting the gang together, even if it's just to hang out, share a meal, uh, just to keep that regular schedule going. Maybe this is a great chance for everyone to go out, get a drink, and talk about the ongoing game. A check-in. Is everyone still having fun? Are you guys having fun playing D&D? &D? Maybe brainstorm. What, what should we do next? What, what game? You know what? We're going to finish this game in six weeks. What should we do next? What Gloomhaven scenario do you want to do next? Hey, what do you want to do with your character? What are you trying to, you trying to get money? Whatever. Or maybe just sit and BS and tell, tell stories, especially in a, in a role-playing game. If you have a regular group that's been playing together for any amount of time, 
just sitting around and talking about, hey, remember when we were level two and this happened? It can be a great way to spend a night. Yep. Heck, if the DM can't make a session of an RPG, the players can still plot, plan, and organize. They might even find some flaws in their strategy and work on a new plan, maybe a more efficient deployment in combat or something. That when you're entirely focused on that game content, you might never have come across. Uh, I know uh, on my online masks RPG, uh, we play on Discord, and sometimes the DM's not logged in, but a bunch of players are there and want to chat. There's still lots of things you can do. You just have to avoid any of those, you know, world-changing, we-need-a-dice-roll moments, mm -hmm. and you can still get things done. Now, for any hosted event, uh, absenteeism, right? You're hosting the event. You're, you're the one that has to be there, right? This is basically what Sean had said. You want to try to find someone to cover you. Uh, again, if you can plan this ahead of time, great. If you don't, uh, you want to try to ask friends and family, right? I did this for the last CG Realm game night. As everyone knows on this, I run game nights fairly regularly at the CG Realm, or at least help them run game nights, depending on who's running what and who's doing the demos. I was supposed to be doing demos of Carpe Diem, a Steppenfeld game I'm really digging, but there was no way I could go to that with the Strep Pro. Plus, like, besides the fact I couldn't talk at that time and I like, had a fever, I didn't want to spread this horrible plague to anyone else. So I asked Deanna if she would mind going to the event without me, and she played teacher and host for that event. As far as I know, it went well. I didn't hear any complaints. It seemed to go well enough. Similar situation happens when the DM is sick for an RPG session, right? It's pretty hard to continue the game without the moderator or whatever that role in games that need that. In this case, my previous advice of playing something else works or finding something meta you can do, like Sean suggested. But there's sometimes another option, which is to find someone to cover you as host and that's getting another player to cover you as GM. Now, this works best when you're playing a very scripted plot and is something I personally done through organized play in Dungeons & Dragons. I both had DMs cover me, and I've run for other DMs who couldn't make it with literally half an hour, 10 minutes notice. Usually this isn't a problem, because most organized play events are, uh, to be honest, on rails, right? They're very scripted. Uh, they don't require the DM to really know what happened prior to the group getting together or really care what happens after. It's just a matter of running that module then. Now, this can also work in a home game, especially when playing pre-written modules, which is something that I find seems to be becoming more and more popular, especially with new people getting into it. Uh, people play through the uh, Pathfinder Adventure Pass, and people are playing, I think, Descent to Avernus is the big D&D &D one that's going on now. Um so when you have that script to think it's possible, another GM could just take it over. Now, you may not want that to be one of the players to not spoil things and everything else. You might have to find someone outside. But it's also possible, it, it, depending on the group you have, where you have no secrets and you're just more about the, the game and telling a story, it's not going to matter that Sean knows that the goblin boss happens to be in Hex C12. It's not going to ruin anything. Now, the worst possible answer, and the one that may be inevitable, though, is that you just have to cancel. Now, the important thing here is to let everyone know what's next. Now that you've had to cancel, let everyone know if the, if the group still stands or if this is a temporary set, setback. And everything's going to be back on schedule. Like, hey, I, I've been sick. I'll get back to it. I'm sorry. I'll run the next event. It's all good. Or if it's a less regular group, at least let people know the, the, the event, the demo game will be rescheduled. So like, hey, we're going to play Twilight Imperium two Saturdays from now, it's like, oh, sorry, we can't make it, but you know what, we'll try next month. But if it's a weekly thing, it's just, hey, you know what, no, it's just one week, we'll be back. Now, if you know exactly when, you're going to reschedule, great. But if not, let people know that you're planning on it. Like, that's basically what's going to happen with the big birthday party. I was going to have a bunch of people over gaming. We'll probably do that sometime here in January, but until I'm 100%, I don't know when that's going to happen. But we do plan on doing something. And of course, sometimes even rescheduling is impossible and you got to give up. This is most likely to happen if the absence is going to be long-term or recurring, whether planned or not. Now, ending a game night and breaking up a group is probably a big enough topic for another full show. Now, the important thing, though, is something we've talked about many times tonight, and that is communicate. Make sure everyone's on the same page and move forward once everyone agrees on what to do next. Absolutely. Now, I think before we jump into the lobby, we're going to talk about... Uh this other option and uh, the, the plan that Jeff has uh, had made available to us on what their group does. Uh, and this came from the Discord. So Jeff uh, has written, they have frequent cancellations and they developed a rhythm for ensuring their game nights happen regardless. 
With the following simple guidelines, they can avoid almost all game night cancellations with six players. If at least nice. three of us can show up and one is a GM, they play. Now, they have a secondary GM with a backup game to play if the primary GM is away. And they were mentioning in the chat room that sometimes that secondary game is the same game. Uh, huh. So it's the same system. So you're just yep. literally hopping characters. Now, well, that's what we were talking about, yep. where you're, you're playing in the same world, right? Yep. You're going to get you're going to dive deeper and see more of the lore in the world by seeing everything from a different set of characters eyes. Yep. Now, they have two or more people willing to host so they can yep. still play if one host is unavailable. And they also have a favorite cafe to play at if both <laughs> hosts are unavailable, which is rare. Nice. Uh, they play games that lend themselves to PCs being missing. And now that's important. So you want to make sure that you're not locking yourself into uh, something where you need to have your palette and your magic user, uh, your, your, you know, or whatever available all mm -hmm. at the same time where you can't get through the magic portal. <laughs> uh, yep. uh, they embrace a mode of play that doesn't require RPing chronologically through everything the PCs do every day. Jump cut to a new scene. And don't worry about explaining why Grog the Barbarian isn't still standing six feet to the left of the doorway where he was last week. Yeah, that's a definitely a modern view of gaming. And I got to admit, when I first got into the Forge and was talking to Nathan D. Paoletta, forced scening was just foreign to me. <laughs> like, I, I don't know what it was. It's, I think it's because RPGs when we grew up came out of war gaming yep. and they, they, they everyone was trying for simulationists which makes no sense when you got flipping elves and dragons, <laughs> but we wanted to care that, well, wait a minute, he was there. What do you, and like, what do you do for the two weeks you're in town? How many times back in the day? All right. What'd you do the next day? Yeah. All right. What'd you do the next day? Hold on. I got to roll to see if anything random happened. Oh yeah. What'd you do that? Like, why, why did we do that? <laughs> we just didn't know better. Right. Yep. Uh, so they tend to play episodic games that expect everyone to be back at HQ yep. for the beginning of each section, like a West March's style D and D campaign or blades in the dark. Uh, and that's actually how my my uh, campaign of masks was working. We had uh, we would only ever play with four players at a time, but there were actually six of us uh, in the the league, the group of uh, of heroes. Uh, but we all started back at our little base every week, so you know whoever was there was the one who went out on the mission. Yeah, and that's exactly why I was able to run AD and D Second Edition for eleven years straight in the same campaign world. Is we played mercenaries called the Obsidian Fist, and every mission. Was the, was the start of the A-Team episode, right? Where the, where the boss calls in and says, this is what you're doing this week. You're going to raid the goblins. You're going to do this. And it was very clear cut. And it didn't matter who was there. That that was the team that was chosen to sent that week. And I, it probably would have worked with paranoia, but it was always, you know, the boss chose you for a reason. Yep. But we're a terrible team. But no, you were chosen for a reason to work together, whatever that may be, in fathomable, yeah, metagame. We didn't know who was going to show up. Yep. And... They say, if finally, if we tackle a game that doesn't favor episodic play, we remove long distance travel as a common trophy section. It's easier to gloss over a member of your Shadowrunner crew being busy elsewhere in the city for an afternoon than it is to explain a, uh, a way a missing travel companion on a quest to Mount Doom. And this is sure. a big thing. You know, if you're if you are traveling across the country with your party to, you know, right the wrongs in a different part of the world, it's a lot harder to explain away, you know, Bob going yeah. missing for a week. Whereas That's where you got to do the, the fade to black. The, yeah. yeah, yeah, Bob was there, of course. He was just <laughs> taking care of Bill the Pony. He was, he, he stepped into that cave over there and, and he, he's going to catch up to us later. Um, but no, it's definitely easier if you're, if you know, if you're sitting, in, if you're in a constrained world mm -hmm. rather than, you know, full universe sandbox traveling. I think one of the important things to realize, especially in role playing games nowadays, is for similitude doesn't matter. Like that, that simulationist aspect doesn't matter. It's all about telling an engaging story and having fun, right? Role that, master that's something that modern disagree. games have taught. Huh? <laughs> role master people will disagree with you. Too. Uh, even then, yeah. like like role master still has magic, right? Like like you can't. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I that's a, a different topic. To be honest, it's a different topic. So what if? Jeff's character is not there this week. Who cares? Just ignore the fact Jeff's character is not there. You don't need an excuse for Jeff's character to not be there. <laughs> if you really want one, sure, but you don't need it. It's not important. It's not going to break anything. Yep. All right. Well, now All that right, we're done with our it. thoughts on the main topic, let's head over to the lobby and see what they think. Uh, 
Jeff Seuss was saying, uh, in a Delta Green campaign, when the GM was away for one session, they ran out a session of Inspectors, a 90s paranormal investigation yep. TV show RPG. Yeah, the Ghostbusters RPG. That's basically what that one is. I, I've actually been tempted to pick that up because one of my Grail games is Ghostbusters from West End Games from years and years ago. So I've heard Inspector's a good replacement, though I still kind of want that original game with the ghost eye. Red Reaper Ryan's mentioning Stefan Feld is apparently a Rollmaster Master fan. Yeah, I was the one that shared that today. <laughs> heard an interview with him on the um, Rolling Dice and Taking Name podcast. Stefan Feld went to Gen Con for the first time ever. Man, is that ever a soft-spoken, very friendly-sounding gentleman. Like, just... and pl Plus, one that makes me cry, because yet again, people talk about not being able to make it in the industry. Stefan Feld has a full-time job, and that's just wrong. Stefan Feld should not need a full-time job for the amount of games he has and has published. And Oh, it drives me nuts that, that content creators like him can't just be content creators at, at that level. That blew me away. But yeah, he's a huge RPG fan, um, played something else, but he's like, yeah, he was a huge fan of Rollmaster, which, you know, guy, it kind of fits. <laughs> if, if you want a point salad role-playing game, yep. yeah, that, that's Rollmaster's about as good as you're going to get. The other news that he dropped is he's got no games coming out this year, but in 2021, he will be releasing his first miniature game. Ooh. So that'll be interesting to see. And I know this is not news for anyone who's actually up to snuff on their podcast, but I'm still <laughs> way behind. And I'm just getting Gen Con news now. So, yeah, I'm catching up. I'm yep. getting there. <laughs> All right. So uh, anyone else have any thoughts on what to do when someone has to cancel? Uh, what do your groups have social contracts? Uh, yeah. So uh, Ryan notes, stop creating RPG campaigns. They're more fun than the ones you're already playing. Yeah, <laughs> that was a problem. Yep. Like, Diana hates me for it. She's like, there's so many, like, uh, which I forget which, awarded campaigns that, like, could have been great that we moved away from. Yep. I said, I don't get it. Like, I, I, why some of this stuff just seems so obvious now, right? That, that just we never thought to sit around and go, wait, are you all having fun? <laughs> like, like, you have the cues, right? You're like, oh, obviously that player's not having much fun and I need to run the game different. Like, why, why didn't I ask? Yeah. Like, are you not digging this? Oh, it just ends up that they got a math test on the weekend and they think they might have failed and they're stressed about their marks, right? Oh, they, they're loving the game, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we, we did do some feedback. Like, you'd be like, hey, is everyone having fun? Yeah, yeah, it's great. But, like, it's just, we, it's that having that adult conversation, why is that so hard yep. for people in general about all topics? Well, and we had issues with, with problem players that we yep. should have been open and well, discussed we, yes, instead, of, instead of discussing behind people's backs. Uh, you yeah, know, we, we, were... we did the whole, oh, no, no, we play on Tuesdays now, and let's not tell that guy over there that we now play on Tuesdays. Yeah. Or, no, we ended that campaign, all, all the bad. Yeah, no, we were, that... we were immature kids that didn't know any better at the time, and hopefully we're able to pass on some of what we've learned from making those mistakes, yes. and you won't have to. I, I hopefully we're, and we still get better. I'm still, yeah. we're still, we're no, we're near perfect. That's for sure. Nope. <laughs> um, what was it? I saw 51st state. I haven't played that. Uh, Red Meeple Ryan's was curious about it. 51st state. I haven't played that, but I played, um, Imperial settlers, which is the fantasy re theme of it. And it was a fantastic game. Uh, 53rd state. It's more of a post-apocalyptic theme. And for some reason it didn't sell well. Once he made it about farming, it started selling better. Now both have been re-implemented in, Oh, first something, first settlers. I'm drawing a blank right now. Ah, we're in the lobby. I'm going to look it up. Is it first settlers? It just came out. No, it's not first settlers. Dang. I, I am drawing. I don't draw blank on <laughs> games very often. That's, that's a rare one for me. Yeah, I can't. Uh, Canada Mirror, the first settlers is from 2004. So. Oh, that one I played. <laughs> I, I own that. First Martian? Mm -hmm. No, no, that supposedly is terrible. Uh, Imperial Settlers is the original. What the hell's the new one? Oh, it's driving me nuts. Imperial Settlers, wow, that ran a lot of awards. <laughs> uh, Imperial Settlers, Imperial Settlers of the North. Empires. Imperial Empires Settlers of the, of the North, North is the new, is this year's. Empires of the North. That's Empires the one North. that re does Imperial Settlers. Okay. Cedeman has Imperial Settlers in the name. But yeah, Emp Empires of the North is supposed to be the new re-implementation of it that does a really good job of it. I really like Imperial Settlers. It's, it's one of the best games I've played. 
Yeah, Imperial Summoners Empires of the North has got uh, seven seven yeah. with, a, with over a thousand ratings. So that's looking... yeah, like I said, it looks really good. Uh... Yeah, if you're more into the fifty first state theme, like I said, the basic thing it's all about putting cards on one side or the other side of um, your player board and attacking other players' buildings and stuff. It, it's solid. I, it's been too long since I played it to be able to do it justice to really describe how to play. So I'm not going to try. But I do enjoy it. I put it this way. I own it. I still own it. I bought a box insert for it, which is why I haven't played it, because I don't <laughs> play anything I buy box inserts for. Exactly. That's that's why I haven't built the Imperial Settlers box insert Sean gave me, because once I do, I'll, I'll never play. Not Imperial Assault. Okay. Um, the game we're talking about later today, Eminent Domain. Because once I build that and put that in the box, there's no way. I'll never play well, it You've got to play it a couple of times for the review. So <laughs> I know. i got, I got to play the, the Exotica <laughs> exp expansion. So that's why I better not. Yep. Once I play Exotica, then I can build it. All right, well, we'll be check back checking in with the lobby a couple more times during the show. Just remember, if you've got a question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And again, if I missed your question, push, repeat. We keep <laughs> growing with the support of fans like you. So please take a minute to subscribe, follow, like, re re review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. We're looking to grow the brand even more with all sorts of new things coming in this year. So now's the time to get in on the ground floor. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. This isn't going to be changing. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the current content we've released uh, in about a week's frame. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, unboxing videos, questions we've asked, reviews, anything else that we create, you get a notification in that email. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletop.bellhop.com website where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, only two weeks left uh, for those of you who are live. It'll be even less for those of you listening on the podcast. Before our next AMA, or I, I say AMA, but it's us, it's two of us, so it's not Ask Me Anything, it's Ask Us Anything. Uh, be sure to mark it on your calendar so you can join us and have your questions answered live. I have a great time doing these shows and be able to interact with the chat room live and answer anything you want to ask. Our AMA episodes hit once a month on the last Wednesday of the month with our first of 2020 hitting on January 29th. All right, Medium. I talked about this last week. I am still waiting on those copies to show up. They, I got the agreement. Everything's There's nothing to sign, but the emails have gone back and forth. We're, we're good to go. I just need them to show up. So as soon as they do, we'll be hosting our next giveaway. Let's listen here and follow us on social media for a heads up when that goes live. All right, one of the things I've been working on lately with, I uh, started mid last year, but I've been stepping it up, is trying to get all of our new logo and our new branding out, our new bells and our new new font and new colors and all the things to go with it. Expect to see our digging bell with the meeple on top spread over the internet. <laughs> now, I thought this would be a good time to give another shout out to RPG and Co for the work they did on this rebranding. I absolutely love uh, the, the logo. I love that bell with the meeple on it. I love the new look. I like the new font. I, everything's great. I do want to also thick the... Thank them for this pretty kick butt mind player shirt that I'm sporting tonight on the live show as well. Now, check our RPG and Co at https www.playrpgandco.com. Also, when you're there, check out their new Beholder shirt because if I can get them to send me another shirt, it's got to be that one. I love it. It's got D8s for eyes. Up next, a review of the Escalation expansion for the deck building game. Eminent Domain. Eminent Domain Escalation was designed by Seth Jaffe, or Haffey, I'm not sure how the J's pronounce that particular one. Features art by Gavin Brown, Eric J. Carter, and Ryan Johnson. Thank you all for having nice, easy to pronounce names. It was published by Tasty Minstrel Games in 2014. I was fortunate enough to pick up a review copy from The Undead Viking at the Tasty Minstrel Games booth at Origins 2019 this year. No, no other compensation was provided for this review. The best way to see what you get in this expansion is to watch our unboxing video on YouTube. For those who haven't seen it yet, and that should be everyone because it hasn't actually come out yet. <laughs> Wasn't, isn't the Eminent Domain one live? Uh, yeah, no. it's been out forever. Is that, oh, is that what the one's out forever? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's been out there like a long time. Oh, sorry, there's, there's another the one that I'm thinking of that's not then. Um, oh, no, it's out there. I linked to it. Okay, the link perfect. Never mind. That work. 
Carry on. Oh, it's For those of you who there. haven't seen it yet, what do you get in the box? All right. First off, it's a very small but solid box. I don't know how to describe it, but like the cardboard's nice. It's a nice solid box for something as tiny as it is that fits actually inside the base box with everything else, which I dig. I actually really appreciate that. I can keep it all together. And not only that, I can keep the eminent domain stuff or the escalation stuff separate from the rest of the stuff. So that's cool. Uh, inside the box, you got a rule book, uh, a TMG catalog, two decks of cards, a rather large sticker, and three punch boards. The instructions themselves are rather thick, actually, for an expansion. 19 pages. Uh, that glossy paper material. But a lot of those 19 pages are reference pages for the new cards because it's the type of thing where you may need to look up exactly like, you know, the card wording isn't perfect. So you look it up in the rule book. My only complaint here is one you'll hear me make on every unboxing video I do. I'll either thank the publisher or, or bemoan them. And that is presenting me with white text over a dark Starfield background. As my eyes get older, I got to say, I love black text on white. Please do not give me white on dark. Yeah, that, that's a big deal for you personally. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, and it's Horizons Extermination is the the what I keep thinking of. Oh, no, that's, 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 that's the one this that's, year. No, yeah, we yeah. haven't done that one yet. I haven't one. opened, well, I've opened it, but I haven't played <laughs> that yet. No, this is, this is Escalation, not yep. Extermination. No, this one's live. Um, deck of cards. Or sorry, punch boards. Punch boards have a whole set of new starting worlds. Uh, they don't replace the originals. You use them in addition, as well as some new reference cards because the way fleets have changed. Fleets are used has changed, and they, they explain it. Uh, these are nice, thick. Uh, the important thing is they perfectly match the quality of the original game. And that's actually a big deal. Uh, one thing I was noticing when we had the Monster Box of Monsters open the other day, uh, week, um, uh, which I'll actually talk about later, is... Uh, they, the card backs aren't the same. Yeah. They're sl Ouch. they're different enough, and the yep. size is actually slightly yep. different. So Ooh, it's... Size, too. I mean, it's a very it's a very slight difference, but you know which, you know, which expansion when, or which set of cards you've got in your hands, even just yeah. by holding your deck. Yeah, that stinks. And, and in this case, I, I noted the punch cards are, are the same. The, the two decks of cards are also of the same quality as the original game. No change in them, no change in color. You literally can't tell them apart, except maybe if you played your original copy a lot and don't sleep your cards like me, you might notice they're not as worn. Like, that's a kind of common problem. Personally, I hadn't played the original game enough to get them to that, you know, revised magic card level at that point. Um, new cards include new world, new technologies, as well as some new roll cards, uh, but not new rolls, just additional rolls. And then a really thick, significant deck of what are called strategy cards. So this, and this is a new, the strategy cards are a whole new concept. Yeah, yeah. I'll get into exactly what you get with it in a bit. But yeah, it's, that's, that's the biggest, one of the biggest additions. Now the sticker is kind of unique. So the sticker is actually an errata for the game board. Now this game doesn't have a big game board. It's just a place to put the cards basically. But two of the rolls, when the pile is exhausted, actually change how they work. And that's supposed to be on the board printed, so you know that. Now, the sticker goes on top of those two rolls, and my God, lining it up is not easy. Uh, one thing to note, well, to make it look perfect, it depends if you care that much. I personally care, and, trying to, and it has a little grid on it, and oh, it was a pain to line up. What's interesting I found out is that later printings of the base game have this fixed. So if you do pick this up, you might want to check to see if your board already matches your sticker. Because that's what happened to me is I spent forever trying to perfectly line it up and then realized that I had the later printing anyway and shouldn't have bothered with the sticker. Sure. All right. So on to what you actually, what this adds to eminent domain. I'll get to the scenarios in a bit because the this expansion actually does three different things. You can mix and match. You could use all three things, or you could use one of the three things, or you can use two or whatever. You can mix and match it. And the first is really simple. You can play with five players. What I like about this is the components for switching it to five players are color-coded, like brightly color-coded. If you check out the blog post, you can see it, like bright blue lines on the cards. And it easily tells you, like, oh, five players, throw this stuff in or take that out. That's always nice because sometimes going through and shuffling, I know a lot of these games, it's like, oh, how many the players you play with? Tiny. Look for this little tiny number yes. or icon in the bottom corner of uh, a, a textured background yes. color. It's like, well, okay, well, the three of us are now going to take the next half hour to sort through the deck of cards. Yeah, just decide to play Terraforming Mars without Corporate Wars once or to pull out <laughs> the Venus expansion. Or, and that's not even the worst. I've, I've definitely seen worse. 
Now, next, we have the scenarios that we talked about earlier. Um, these add an asymmetric element to the game. Uh, basically, turns out eminent domain into an asymmetric game right from the start. Start of the game, you're going to get a scenario card, and then that tells you which your starting hand is, which roles you're going to start with in your hand. And they're going to give you different starting worlds, so it's going to tell you you're going to pick one from the originals or you're going to start with a random metallic world. And it'll even give you some starting technologies, which is actually a big change to the game because it kind of jumps you to the mid-game instead of having to play up that build-up at the beginning. That's a nice little step. Now, the final thing Escalation adds are new technologies, worlds, and core rule changes. Now, this is the, the significant thing. The biggest rule changes in how fleets work in the game. These fleet rules are tied to the new technologies and world cards. Players can now use fleets instead of research to pay for some of the technologies, and then certain worlds now can only be settled by certain sizes of ships. Now, what this basically does is changes the warfare role from the base game basically making it more important, more useful, more versatile, and makes it a much more viable strategy while reducing the power of the research power. Which is really what was needed, because I don't think uh, just making that warfare role viable was enough to overcome the fact that researching could, re could really win the game for you. Yeah, I, I, I agree somewhat. Now, when Escalation came out, there was a ton of buzz, a lot of people talking about how this expansion fixed eminent domain. And I got to admit, I don't completely agree, at least in regards to the, the, the new warfare rules, the, the rule changes, because I, I just found the base game work great. And I never actually found warfare that underpowered or research that overpowered, except when players were learning the game. Once everyone knew what was going on, it was different. Yes, research is very strong, but if all the players know research is very strong and that those what those stage three research cards can do, everyone can then play to make sure the players don't get those overpowered combos and make sure you can cut off the other players. And Warfare, I found actually perfectly valid, but it's one you couldn't do on its own. You couldn't just do Warfare. And once you knew that, and everyone else at the table knew that, and everyone was at the same experience level, that was just playing eminent domain. Yeah, you can't just do warfare. It's just part of the game. Personally, I didn't find it was something broken or any way that needed anything that needed to be fixed. Fair. Sure. Now that said, I do like the rule changes. So I'm not saying escalation's garbage because it didn't fix the game. No, I like the changes. It changes the feel of the game enough to make it feel like you've changed it, right? Without changing it too much where you feel like you're playing a different game, which I've the, my classic example for that is Settlers of Catan and Cities and Knights of Catan. To me, those are two totally separate games. You still play like you're playing Eminent Domain. Now, I found the biggest impact on gameplay didn't come from the changes to Warfare, rather the new diversified technologies that required more than one type of world. Because in the base game, to get a technology, you needed to stick to one type of planet. Now there was a valid way to, to diversify, to not just get the one thing. And there's one particular technology that it's not just one card. There's one for every different planet type called double time. I found the double time card and the ability to diversify over having to specialize in a planet changed the game way more than the fact that you could now build up your fleets and you can now use ships to take technologies. Sure. Now, I would go so far to say the game is better with these rules, but I don't think it's like groundbreaking. It fixes the game. Don't play eminent domain without it. But now that you have it, would you take it out? See, I have. I've actually done both, I, especially when I'm teaching new players. So one of the things I didn't get into this in the detail in the review, and we talked about it whenever we talk about playing Eminent Domain, is this is a game that rewards system mastery. And your first three games of Eminent Domain are going to be nothing like your sixth game of Eminent Domain. Actually, your third game is probably going to be nothing <laughs> like your first. Like, there is a definite learning curve. And knowing what cards are out there and knowing what the, the technologies do and knowing which technologies to go for and which technologies to go for because someone else is doing something and how to react to it. And Escalation, because it adds especially more technologies and more worlds and more options, I would much rather teach the game with just the base rules. But even with experienced players, the base game's a little simpler and a little quicker, especially at three players. So if I have less time, I might pull it out. Now, regarding the addition of a fifth player, I, I personally think this is the least useful thing in the box. 
Now it's great. Uh, we talked about it before that, yeah, okay, you know what? An extra person showed up tonight or, you know what? Our six-player game's canceled. We can at least play Eminent Domain. I personally think there's much better five-player games out there. We just had a whole bunch of them talked about in our feedback session of tonight's show. Um, I think even with Escalation, this game is almost a play-it-at-three-player-only game. Like, it is definitely best at three players. I would probably turn down a game at five players unless someone begged me and find something else to play when I'm at five. Interesting. And I was just just checking real quickly. They don't have this expansion on uh, Board Game Arena, it looks like. Oh, well, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. We haven't played it. We were playing this on Board Game Arena, but that's you need to play this yeah, real it's time. Yeah, real time is, is the way to do it. Because there's just too much to think about to, to come back two days later. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the final part, of course, is that scenario system I mentioned, and this is my favorite part, which would be no one's surprise. Everyone listening to this podcast should know by now that I love asymmetry in my games. I love a game where everyone starts with something different and has to adopt their play based on what those differences are, and that is exactly what Escalation adds to Eminent Domain. Yeah, I mean, we all, everyone who listens to the show is, is, is well aware. Yes, I think so. I, 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 yes. Now, overall, I may disagree that es Escalation is must-have that fixes Eminent Domain. I do think there's a lot to like here. Uh, if you dig Eminent Domain and don't own this, I do recommend picking it up. Uh, to me, it's almost a, like, just do it. There's there's no reason not to. Uh, though you might be like me and still enjoy the base game and sometimes pull out all the fancy new stuff and play with just the original. Fair enough. And uh, just uh, to note that BGG does list uh, it's still as best three with the expansion or without. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's a three-player game, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. No, it the really three-player extended game specifically, because there's two ways to play three-player. All right, well, for a somewhat more in-depth look at eminent, eminent, eminent domain escalation, check out Moe's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on reviews. Yeah, there's quite a bit more detail over there. I cut this one down quite a bit just to give everyone the brief overview. I get into a little bit more detail about what the actual changes are and what some of the fleet changes are. Also, if you want to see this expansion in action, we do have an actual play. Uh, one of the nights where one of our players canceled on Gloomhaven, we decided to play something else and recorded a three-player game with Tori and Kat. You can find that over at youtube.com slash tabletopbellhop. Uh, just look at our tabletop game actual play playlist and you'll find it in there and now the bell ops tabletop where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year what games hit our tables uh every week we like to take a look back at the games we played any events we attended and any other cool gaming stuff that's been going on now due to this near unending case of strep throat that i really hope is going to be a done by the end of the week here i have gotten pretty much no gaming in very very little um last night though i did manage to get out no i'm not contagious anymore i wasn't spreading the plague i have lots of antibiotics um i don't even cough that often so it's it's not like i was gross uh we did manage to get out to a local coffee shop that we like well my oldest was at a, at an after school class and we played Gorinto. Uh, this is from Grand Gamers Guild. This was the prototype game that I unboxed during the Pento Suite after show at the end of last week's show. Yeah, and after uh, picking up the uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle uh, Defense Against the Dark Arts game for Christmas, my family has the Harry Potter bug once again, so we got the Monster nice. Box of Monsters out on the table. Very cool. So just quick and dirty on Gorinto. Uh, it's an abstract tile placement and drafting game themed after Gorinto temples in Japan. They actually, for an abstract game, there's a lot of tie in here to the name of the game. I was pretty impressed by that. Uh, you are moving tiles representing one of the five elements of wind, air, fire, water, and void from the path, which is the area on the outside of the board, onto the mountain, which is a five by five grid of tiles on the center of the board. When you, where you pick the tile from determines which row or column you can put it in, and what element the tile is that you pick determines both how many tiles you get to take from the mountain and where you get to take them from. Now, you're collecting these tiles into a, your own personal little tableau, trying to collect sets, and the sets you want are based on randomized scoring and gold cards that are set up at the beginning of the game. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on details here since I know I'll be talking about this one in more detail during a future review segment. It is one that I plan on playing more, but I will say this is a surprisingly deep 
thinky game that Deanna and I both really enjoyed. There is way more going on here than the simple rules. Like it's a, it's a short, like seven page rule book. And that includes examples and variant setups for the board. Uh, really simple rules. Uh, at this point though, I've only played two players. Game plays up to four. I am really looking forward to exploring this one more. Now I do have one final comment about Garinto, but rather about Grey and Gamers Guild. So Mark Spector is the one who contacted me and sent me this preview copy of the game. And he has been fantastic. Mark has been constantly checking in to see if I have any questions. Did you get the game? Did you check the rule book? Have you read the rule book? Is there anything I can clarify? Well, last night when we were playing, when we were sitting at the coffee shop, there was a question I had. And I actually had a Facebook chat going with Mark Spector as we played our first game. And he was repeat, re replaying to me real time. Like, it was fantastic. The support he has offered as a publisher has been more than I've ever seen and all the time I've, I've, I've spent reviewing games. So a big shout out and thanks to Mark of Grand Gamers Guild for, I, I guess, being there, like for, for like caring. I, I don't know. Like it, it, it's to me, it's unprecedented. Like I said, to, to sit there and be playing a game for the first time and uh, like have a live line to the, to the publisher. Like I, I was taking picture. I'm like, is this right? What, what's this component for? He's like, oh, those are supposed to get removed from the box. We ordered some extra items for a prototype. Those shouldn't have got sent to you. And <laughs> what are these for? He's like, oh, I totally forgot to give you the rules for the dragon tiles. Here's what those are for. And at one point, like, are, are you supposed to lap the scoreboard by round three? He's like, oh, yeah, definitely. I'm like, okay, cool. It was awesome. I, I, I big, big thumbs up to Mark Spector. Excellent. Well, and that was Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild. Now, my family got uh, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, but not the Defense Against the Dark Arts, the actual original uh, co-op game, and we were back at the Monster Box of Monsters. Now, for those of you who remember the last time we talked about it, which was quite some time ago, uh, we had kind of stalled on it because we hadn't had a, we hadn't had any luck. Uh, but we got it to the table again, and first time through that uh, that night, we finally beat Box One in the Monster Box of Monsters. Nice. Um, and we were very careful about not cheating and not stacking the deck or anything deck? like that. No. Uh, and I, actually, at one point, we went back. Uh, we actually had to backtrack about three turns uh, because we realized uh, you aren't allowed to de to deal any damage to the Dark uh, dark Lord until everything has been cleared. Wow. And we had missed the fact that one of the other cards, not one of the other enemies, but another wow. card on the table also stops you from doing that. So we had to back up a few steps and it's like, all right, no, let's we're going to do this right we're going to win we're going to win correctly let's let's step back and and do that and and we still managed to uh to beat him so uh my daughter's been hoping to get it back on the table again she's been asking so nice. it looks like we're back at it uh that that victory was a nice boost to uh to keep the interest up in it what changed um i think it was just sort of you know the new year and you know back to you know she had seen she had seen uh, my son and i playing the dueling game and she had been interested in playing, but it's only two player. Right. Uh, and then she she wanted to play and she wanted to be involved with all of us. Oh, uh, awesome. So we got that other box out. And uh, no, it was it was great. And I'm interested to see now what new thing they add in the box, too. Because oh, you haven't opened one... it to see? No, we there. haven't opened it yet. So uh, right. that's uh, hopefully maybe not by next week, depending because of what's coming coming up this weekend. Yeah. But uh, hopefully soon. All right. Very cool. So. About a look, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, assuming this plague uh, finally clears and the damn amoxicillin I'm on actually works, uh, Sean should be heading down to Windsor, and that should mean more than the usual amount of gaming and hopefully make up for the lack of gaming I've had so far in 2020. Like, it's halfway through January. I played one game. That's just lame. Um, in the middle of this, uh, we will be taking a trip to easy mode for our monthly bits and boards game night, third Saturday of every month. So Sean will get to see easy mode for the first time and we'll be playing some games in public. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Heard so much about it on the show all these times, but just haven't made it into uh see the place yet. So. Uh, besides that, I am looking forward to actually getting together with my Monday night group. Uh, this fits in well with today's topic, right? So today's topic was mainly inspired by them and me having to cancel our two weeks game nights, as well as my birthday gaming night and, and like our annual gaming in the new year party. We've been doing that for years. People count on that, right? I am looking forward to getting the group back together, 
And honestly, having one of those conversations we talked about, I think it's time that group, we need to sit down and talk about what we want out of 2020. Because it's one of those groups where we have canceled so many times that people don't even expect us to play. And even when everyone's free, someone's not because they're like, oh, I figured we haven't played the last three weeks. Why would we be playing today? So it's time to have that adult conversation, right? And uh, either disperse the group and or get everyone to rededicate themselves to meeting regularly once again. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully this coming Monday. Um, if not, maybe I'll send out something like, hey, everyone, please try to set time aside. We need to talk and get together. Maybe it's not even on Monday. I'm hoping the end result is more actual gaming on Mondays and maybe we'll come up with a plan like Jeff's with, with more redundancies. Cause we did have a plan. It was, it, we are going to role play no matter what, unless two players are short and then we're going to play board games, which sounded like enough of a plan, but it obviously wasn't. Yep. <laughs> um, then next Saturday, January 18th, uh, we're back at the CG realm 10 or 5 PM to 10 PM. Uh, free open gaming, family oriented, family friendly, come uh, out, play some isn't, games. Isn't the 18th, CG Realm? Or that's sorry, CG Realm. Uh, easy mode. Isn't that the oh, 25th? 25th? The 25th oh, oh, will be CG 25th. Realm. 25th. I can't read my own calendar. <laughs> sorry. The 18th. 18th <sighs> is easy mode. 25th. Back at the CG Realm from 5 till 10. You're muted. You're muted. We didn't hear any of that. Uh, sorry. By the 18th, by the time people hear this podcast, the 18th's already passed. <laughs> sorry, the 25th. January 25th, we will be back at the CG Realm for the regular CG Realm game night, uh, Tecumseh and Parent, no, Hall? No, I don't even know what road, the, Tecumseh and Hall, Tecumseh and Hall, I don't know where Parent came from, Tecumseh and Hall, Parent's where Easy Mode is, Ottawa and Parent, Tecumseh and Hall, uh, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., free, open, family-friendly, LGBT-friendly, open gaming, come out, play some games, no cost, uh, people always bring games. Uh, we always feature a game. Ian hasn't decided what we're doing for that night yet. Um, last week they did Unmatched, which I unfortunately couldn't be there for. Uh, that's a hot new game from Restoration Games. I'm not sure what it'll be. It'll be something cool. Now, if Medium shows up in time, it might be that. That might be our demo night, though I think I want to be able to promote it. So that'll probably be next month. But yeah, see your rum 5 to 10. If you're in the Windsor area, come on out, play some games. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Roger Lynn Scott Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, thanks, Brian. Yuho Rutila, I think we finally got through all of your comments on the blog. Again, I do apologize for the delays, silly spam filter, everything should be caught up now. So start commenting again. <laughs> Duran Barnett, thanks. Uh, Jeff Seuss, I got to say thank you for the great advice for our topic tonight. That's awesome. It was great to have someone else's perspective added to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you dig the content we're providing and would like to support our continued effort, we would greatly appreciate it if you considered tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30 p.m. Well, that possibly about... join us on Thursdays to watch some live streaming of some super hot, fresh, new Star Wars, The Old Republic, that video game everyone was talking about a long time eight, ago. Eight years ago, yeah. Eight years ago, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're playing an eight-year-old MMO. But to but be fair, nice there the... are a lot of other people also yeah. playing and streaming. The, the game is definitely the not game. dead. The game is not dead. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, Thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the Penthouse Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. There was a bell near me. <laughs>